Hello, and welcome to the fourth collaboration between the Columbia Alumni Leaders Experience, also known as CALE, and the CAA Columbia at Home. My name is Sean Hoyt, and I'm an SBS graduate and member of the CAA Board of Directors and the CALE Steering Committee. Like many of you, I am a dedicated Columbia alumni volunteer. And for those of you joining us as part of our Columbia at Home program, we are hoping to give you a glimpse into the content alumni volunteers are privy to on an ongoing basis. For me, being a graduate of the Sustainability Management Program at SPS and having the opportunity to shape our fourth week, sustainability, leadership, and communities has been one of my volunteer highlights. Immediately following the program, please stay on for a list of resources and opportunities to engage in how to create a more sustainable world, discover what Columbia is doing in this critical area for our global community, and of course, how to engage with Columbia in meaningful ways. This evening is possible because of the CAA and CALE's collaboration with the Earth Institute, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, Columbia World Projects, and the CAA Columbia Wine Industry Network. And now, please join me in welcoming a truly impressive group of Colombians to the virtual stage led by our moderator, John Furlow, Deputy Director of the IRI. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Sean. Thank you everybody for joining us. As Sean said, I'm John Furlow. I'm the Deputy Director of the IRI or the International Research Institute for Climate and Society which is part of the Earth Institute at Columbia. Tonight, we're gonna to have an interesting discussion about the impacts of a changing climate on one of our favorite things, wine. I'm joined by three people with expertise on wine or climate or both. Um, we will discuss some of the risks winemakers face now and the longer term challenges they face as the climate continues to change. The theme for this week's events is sustainable agriculture, sustainable communities. Often when we talk about climate impacts, we tend to use the terms adaptation and resilience more than we do sustainability. I think this is because a changing climate imposes shocks or stresses on resources. And we think about adapting in order to achieve resilience to further stresses. Sustainability is a very similar concept, but with more of a feel for not using up the resources at hand rather than guarding against external threats. I'm gonna give a quick introduction to our panelists. Um, the star of tonight's show is Julie Johnson, who is a Columbia alum, who's been making excellent wines for well over 20 years. She's currently the owner of Trace Saboris Winery in California. I'm also joined by two of my colleagues. Um, Angel Munoz is a scientist, a climate scientist who earned his degree in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia. He's now working with the IRI on the intersection of climate variability and important issues for developing countries such as food security, health, and nutrition. We're also joined by Carmen Gonzalez, who was a recent graduate of SEPA, uh, who interned with IRI on our Act Today project, which is one of the Columbia World Projects, the first Columbia World Project. And then we were lucky enough to have Carmen join us after she graduated. And Carmen works on climate and food security as well as climate and nutrition. Now, before we get started talking about wine, uh, I guess this is like making you, <laughs> I'm gonna talk a little bit about IRI's work and some of the, the connections between climate variability and climate change and uh, the agriculture sector, including wine. The IRI was founded after researchers at Columbia figured out how to predict the onset of El Nino um, several months before the effects start to be felt in different parts of the world. El Nino is a phenomenon that influences the weather all over the world. During an El Nino, some parts of the world get warmer, some get cooler, some get wetter, some get drier. Some are not affected much at all. During a La Nina, a different set of conditions prevail. The Columbia researchers and some of their colleagues at NOAA saw that this sort of foresight could be incredibly valuable for decision makers. They created the IRI as an institute dedicated not only to research on how the climate system works and how it can be predicted, but also research on how key aspects of our lives and livelihoods are affected by those changes and how advanced information on the near futures climate can be communicated and used for better decisions. IRI, excuse me, IRI works mostly in the developing world where agriculture dominates economic life and where food security and disease are a constant concern. 
agriculture can account for 70% of jobs and a third or more of GDP in some countries. A bad weather year can devastate a national economy and throw workers into deepening poverty. The burden of disease with the the burden of diseases with a climate influence, such as mosquito-borne malaria, dengue, or Zika, weighs on individuals and whole economies. IRI specializes in producing seasonal, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> producing climate information at multiple time frames. We produce seasonal forecasts looking out across the next few months, as well as subseasonal forecasts looking out a couple of weeks to a couple of months. And we find that this information, as well as a weather forecast looking out a few days, really helps decision makers plan, prepare, and manage climate risks. At IRI, we want to understand how to predict the conditions that strain economic activity and undermine health. IRI is a pioneer in what we call climate services. Climate services encompass not just the production of climate information, but also making sure that decision makers understand it, that they can access that information, and that they're able to use it. We are a research institute, but we also work hand in hand with colleagues and partner countries to train them to use our technology and our tools. On the communication issue, imagine that a, a climate scientist might be perfectly comfortable with a forecast that says something like, we anticipate a 45% probability of below normal rainfall. Uh, that might not mean much to a farmer or a health worker. They wouldn't know how to interpret a statement like that. More useful might be something like, we think there's a good chance the next growing season is gonna be like 2014 when it was unusually hot and dry. Once we get the information rephrased, it has to reach people so they can use it. We work with local organizations in the countries where we work to understand how to use existing communication channels to reach different audiences. We need to know how people like to receive information. Do farmers have cell phones? Do they have smartphones? Do they rely on radio? What's, what's the best medium for reaching people? Because if we, if we can't reach them, uh, the information won't help them at all. Finally, we want to see that the use of this new technology gets embedded in normal practice. This means working to truly change behavior. In some cases, it means changing the policies of the agriculture ministry or the weather agency or the health ministry so that they maintain these new practices after we're gone means training local partners to do all of this for themselves and demonstrating that there's a benefit to going to this effort. That capacity building component is entirely appropriate for a university like Columbia. I do promise that we will get to line, but I wanna to turn to, to my two colleagues, Angel and Carmen, to talk a bit about our work. Angel, you trained as a physicist and a climate scientist, but now you work closely with agriculture officials and health officers. Um, can you tell us a bit about your approach and how it differs from perhaps more traditional climate scientists? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, John and, and everyone for the opportunity uh, for being able to be here and talk, talking a little bit about sure. what we do at the, at the IRI. So indeed, um, I think that if we, if I needed to define the kind of work that we do, I would say we work to ignite climate services around the world. And you have been mentioned uh, mentioning uh, uh, several of these like um, like pillars, like building blocks of the work that we do. As you just said, the traditional approach might be like a climate scientist or a physicist just sits in front of uh, a computer and then has like some models that can say something about what might happen in the distant future or, you know, in a few days or in a few months. And then it gets really excited and says, okay, I'm gonna use this to save the world. And then at some point, you know, like starts talking to some other people that the kind of work that we do at the IRI is just, we start just the other way around. It's just the opposite of that. We are demand driven. That means that we go and we talk not only to the minister of this particular country, but we talk to the farmers. We talk to the extensionists who really have a, a nice relationship to the farmer, with the farmer. And then we co-identify what is needed. And we sit with them and we say, well, you mm -hmm. know, maybe you, you want to have this precise, this level of precision in order to make this forecast, but that might, might not be useful. Maybe what we need is not perfect forecast. What we need is actionable forecast. We need information that can be used to make decisions. So 
just to summarize that, that first part of the kind of work that we do with this igniting climate services, uh, uh, you know, like goal, objective, is, is that we start with the decision maker, not with the scientist sitting in front of the computer. The scientist goes and then tries to co-develop with the decision maker that product that she or, or, or he or, you know, general wants. So climate services, as you just mentioned, has to do with this generation of the climate information, co-generation because of the way we work with the translation, with the transfer, and finally the use. If we have perfect forecast, but no one is using that, so then we, we don't really have uh, climate services. And in order to do that, in order to talk about actionable information, actionable um, yeah, products that we can use to make decisions, we need to understand that forecasts are not perfect, that the information is not perfect. You need, we need to put in context that information. That means we need to understand the past in order to really understand the present and understand what that particular forecast means. And that involves, as you just said, working with these probabilities is a way that we have to provide information about uncertainties. And the other important thing that we do, as you just said, is that we work at multiple timescales because through that demand, through that work that we have with the decision makers, we have learned that it's not about what might happen in terms of climate change at the end of the century, what might happen in the next few days or next few weeks or next few months, as you just said, seasonal timescales. It has to do with a continuum, a spectrum of timescales that the decision makers really need. So with this, we are able not only to do um, a forecast of temperature or rainfall for your particular location that will be very helpful in order to make decisions for wine in this particular context, but we have been able to do a lot of work with undernutrition, even migrations, even to be able to say why the recent Central American migration happened that has to do with climate change. Also, as you just mentioned too, with Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya, and even some forecast for coffee and another key product that are related to nutrition. And as you said, that is a part of what our colleague, uh, Carmen Gonzalez, uh, has been doing at the IRI too. So probably Carmen wants to talk a little bit more about that. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. My name is um, Carmen Gonzalez. I work with John Parlow and Angel Muñoz in ACT Today, which is uh, the first Colombia World Project, as John mentioned, and it stands for Adapting Our Culture to Climate Today for Tomorrow. Um, the objective of ACT Today is to um, uh, support developing countries to, in, to achieve SEG2 by enhancing climate services in those countries. We're currently working in six countries, uh, Guatemala and Colombia and Latin America, um, Senegal and Ethiopia and Africa, and Bangladesh and Vietnam in Asia. Um, you probably all know what the SEG2 is, but just as a reminder, it aims to uh, fight food insecurity, improve nutrition levels, and promote sustainable agriculture. Um, we understand that this is a very ambitious goal and it's a very complex problem, the one that these countries face, but al it's also worth fighting for because it's key for the socioeconomic development of, the, of these countries in particular. Um, ACT today um, is based on the IRI principles that uh, Angel just mentioned. And I'm gonna talk about the activities that we develop in the Latin America and the Caribbean team, which is the team I work at. But these principles are also applicable, excuse me, to the other four countries we work at. We um, at IRI, we have a very demand-driven approach. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's a lot of efforts going on in these countries to fight food insecurity, but we also understand that um, the added value that IRI can bring to, to this project it's, it's huge uh, in the sense that we are helping uh, min the different ministries, including uh, national med services to uh, provide a more um, a tailored and adapted uh, forecast to different decision makers. Through in the six different countries, we implemented or co-implemented uh, this next generation climate forecast that allows uh, decision makers to look at climate at a seasonal level, which um, implies up to uh, three months of forecast at, at subseasonal level that goes up to six weeks. We also help the national med services to improve the, the access 
and an availability of uh, data by bridging the gap that they should have with um, weather station using satellite data. We have also had to work with um, stakeholders like more on the ground, like the, the food industry. We had to work with national farmers associations. For example, in Guatemala, we work with the National Coffee Association to develop um, a next gen um, crop and yield, um, um, and yield model using this next gen information that I just mentioned about. But also very importantly, we brought together climate uh, service users and providers through the development of uh, agroclimatic roundtables. These tables are key for the transfer of this climate information that is generated by the, the national net services and allows decision makers on the ground, whether those are national um, farming associations or vulnerable communities or subs, uh, um, subsistence farming, farmers to implement climate information. Uh, we also worked with um, the Rice Farmer Association in Colombia to develop index-based insurance, for example. Um, we also work with UN agencies like WFP in Guatemala and in Colombia and FAO to develop forecast-based financing that would allow decision maker to, be, to uh, kind of manage the resources they have based on the forecast of cases they need to look after. We also work with the Ministry of Health uh, in Guatemala to develop a forecast, an early warning system that allows them to forecast cases of uh, undernutrition for kids under five based on climate and non-climate information and variables. Um, there's a different activities that we're developing in the six countries, but something that um, that is common to, as well, common to six of them is there's a gap in education when it comes to climate services. Um, and that gap affects not only people on the ground, like farmers with uh, maybe a low level of literacy, but also um, officials working in the ministries. Um, there is a demand for a better um, or like improved uh, capacity building trainings for um, extensionists who are the link between the Minister of Agriculture and farmers on the ground to understand um, how can they, can they translate the information generated by the National Met Service to the needs of people on the ground. Um, so all these activities that we are developing in, in these countries linked together in the form of the National Framework for Climate Services. This is a, an initiative uh, from the World Meteorological Organization that they're trying to strengthen climate information in developing countries and also developed ones uh, to make sure that decision makers at different level, whether on the ground uh, with vulnerable communities all the way up to the ministries can actually um, take or, or make decisions based on in uh, on information uh, accurate information based on climate uh, and to improve their capacity to adapt and, and mitigate uh, the effects of climate and i know there is a lot of information uh going on about the work we're doing and, and, and act today but um since we're talking about wine I think it's maybe it's time to move to, to John again and go back to, um, to the main topic of the, of the night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Angel. Uh, Carmen's right. We did invite everybody here to talk about wine. Um, so a question you might be asking is, what does a winemaker from California have in common with people who usually work with millet farmers in Africa or coffee farmers or maize farmers in Central America? Um, and I'll give, I promise to turn it over to Julie in just a minute, but a, a, I think a little over a year ago, Ken Catandela contacted me and said that he had this network of Columbia alumni who make wine and that some, several of them had mentioned a concern about how managing, how the, excuse me, the, the changing climate might affect their businesses. And Ken introduced us to Julie we began talking about the timeframes of decisions that are common in, in winemaking. Do they align with the types of information that we produced? And through the Act Today project that Carmen was talking about, we had begun working with coffee farmers and in some cases in other work that we do with uh, cacao farmers and 
And Ken and Julie helped us realize that we do have this, we, we may have information that would be useful for people who grow things uh, beyond annual crops. And so uh, we wanted to keep working with the wine business. And so um, <clears throat> we've been talking with Julie, but also with some other alumni in Ken's network. And we're looking at ways of collaborating with them on some tools that would give them the same forewarning of conditions in the next season or the next few weeks that we've been providing in uh, Latin America and Asia for years. So with that, I would like to turn to Julie now. Julie, you're a smallholder you? production winemaker. Hi. Um, Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, it's great to be here today. No, it really is to talk about these, these issues. Thank you. Um, so you've been affected by climate change uh, on an ongoing ba basis. You're based in Napa Valley. Um, could you give us a sense of how both the last, the fire season of the last few months, but also things you've seen over the last few years have affected you economically and what has it done to the, the ecosystem that you've developed at Trace Flores? Yeah. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Julie Johnson. I run a very small, I have a 35 acre farm here in the Rutherford bench area of the Napa Valley. Uh, Napa being actually a very small place, we only grow 4% of California's grapes. But I think that one of the questions to explore is, yeah, what does a, what does a grapevine farmer, what does a culturalist have in common with somebody growing millet or somebody growing coffee? Well, to begin with, we're working with perennial plants. We're working with plants that have great resilience, as it turns out. And I think that we're all, um, we're looking at a crop that is essentially a high value crop. I mix it up for the sake of diversity. I also grow pomegranates and I grow olives. Um, I grow lemons just for the sake of diversity. And I think many other smaller farmers see diversity as a pathway and one of the foundational pillars to sustainability. But I think we share a lot of things besides that. In a high volume crop, we're learning how to manage the climate change around that. We're looking at both short term and long term parameters. And we're looking at the idea that we can be affected short term by climate, or we can, as we found out in Napa over the last three years, we can be affected quite dramatically by these cataclysmic events. In fact, the most recent fires encompassed almost, burned almost 40% of Napa County, having burned 10% of Napa County in 2017. And the estimation is that our economy lost about a billion dollars, about a third of our economy. I think even more importantly that what I would have in common with a lot of farmers on the ground is that we're all providing, even though you might say, oh, wine is a luxury crop, but here even in Napa County, we're providing a foundational income, a foundation for the very community and a structure that can be sustainable with, as we, many of us are coming to believe, more attention to the climate. We know right now that the farm worker community in this area probably lost close to $50 million just in the harvest season alone. And that's just the farm working community. So when we're really looking at this, I think what we're really looking at the farm managers needing to define what can be measured and managed with respect to the bottom line. And indeed, um, I think what you all are speaking to is how do we develop a common language, especially with respect to carbon issues. Now, as an aside, we probably, in these huge fire events, we probably released the equivalent of an entire year of 25 million cars operating in California, an entire year of carbon emissions. But that aside, there's, I think we, are still, we still also believe that there's a great deal of importance to attaching carbon neutrality to our own small operations. And how do we get there? How do we get a language so that we can get there? Do we, how do we communicate? Right now, most of us basically communicate in terms of transactional communication, ordering propane, buying tractors, how many this and that. We're, common, we're really communicating in BTUs. Perhaps we need to establish a carbon dialogue, a carbon definition that we could actually all apply to our bottom line. Because I guarantee you I'm not alone as a small farmer, 
looking at what is that bottom line. And you guys have been so cool about bringing up the whole idea of what is a pillar, what is a sustainable pillar to a community? Well, it's inclusion, it's social justice, it's education in a broad sort of way. It basically is the idea of safety, worker safety. You can't work in a climate that is all of a sudden 15% more humid. That's a dangerous situation for workers. And there's also an enlightenment. Uh, you can also call it adaptation. What I don't want to call it is buy-in, but what I think that stretches from the, from you could say it stretches from the top down, but actually more importantly, the swell of adaptability and of enlightenment of an education that gives everybody a sense of this is our common goal, you know, working together. So we have longer terms, Napa, the grape growing region is, is definitely looking longer term. It takes five years for a grapevine to be in the, in the vine and get to productivity. So 0.3 degrees de per decade of warming makes a difference. 2.6 degrees Fahrenheit of warming over the 20th century average makes a difference. People are already seeing what happens when you have to replant a vineyard in response to climate warming. Um, planting, replanting a, a, a Cabernet vineyard uh, with say Zinfandel, have to plug here, or a Petit Syrah is hugely disruptive. There's an eruption of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide release. So perhaps the longer term approach, you guys giving us the long term picture the tr larger picture of trending gives us the opportunity to make a decision maybe to keep the vines in the ground a little longer and hold the carbon neutrality a little bit longer. On the short term, basic managers are looking to gather data, say yield estimation, big deal. Whether you're working with table grapes or quality wine grapes, you're looking to make managerial analysis of the data. So we were looking to short-term forecast data on climatic trends. So it'll drive how the ground data can be interpreted. Yes, John, people are looking, they're using uh, drones, they're using satellite analysis, they're using boots on the ground, they're using people with cell phones to identify individual interactions with each vine, 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 on a cell phone on a short on a smartphone and they can be directed to make pruning decisions and shoot thinning and canopy management and soil moisture management decisions based on on all of that so yeah i mean we've had huge huge impacts this year that are going to be difficult to get around the bottom line is that it's more um, a long-term economic and marketing issue for many of us because we don't know about the issue of the chemical interaction that creates smoke taint in a wine we, that's all up in the air right now. Nobody's going to put bad wine in the in the, the bottle for you. This is some of my 2020 right here. You know, I'm testing it. I'm spending lots of money to do that. But the bottom line is that fewer people are employed here. Fewer people are making up the fabric of this community in a in a healthy way. Diversity inclusion. It's all about. That's a, that's a sustainable pillar. Economic justice is a sustainable pillar. Our partnership on, on a very small scale, my little partnership with um, my wild spaces has, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a paradigm shift thinking of wild spaces, the, the, the urban natural interface that we're all part of if we're part of the, the wine grape growing community. It's that interface we're so close to space that are vulnerable to cataclysmic issues like fire and drought. We're in the most intense drought that we've been in since 1976 right now. But I'm making little discrete decisions all the time, composting, cover cropping, I dry farm, erosion control, uh, using a crimper to till instead of a mower and a tiller to till. Um, I'm looking at enriching avian systems. I'm looking at Interestingly enough, now we're all looking at indigenous systems for uh, dealing with fire loading in the hills and what can we do to clear and burn wisely over a period of time. 
there's just such a lot of um, there's just such a lot of work to do. But I'm one of those people that believes that incremental with information, incremental activities can can make a difference. And I think you giving us the short term as well as long term have impacts for data day to day to day, but also for long term industries. And perennials are definitely long term you know industries. We have standards set by my own my own association california certified organic farms napa green slow food these are things that i think again all farmers share they want to get better they want to do best practices but they do need to understand that how they can for example have a community invest in a carbonator this is this incredible machine that takes all of our woody waste all of our prunings and regurgitates it, basically burns it very efficiently and produces biochar that we can use to provide nutrition to the vineyard floor. Um, how do we all collectively or even individually invest in something like that? How do we make that part of our bottom line? That's a, that's a, big, that's a big challenge. So looking at healthy, economic, viable, community-based farming, whether we're a fancy wine appellation or whether we're, we're farmers in, a, in, a, in an upcoming world theory. So, you know, it, it's looking at the network. I think, there, I think Ken has identified something like 87 alums, Columbia alums, who are scattered around all of this incredible, these, lat, these wine producing latitudes around the world. And I'm, I'm hoping, for example, that Napa can take on or other areas can take on the idea of climate fellows um, to guide, to lead, to make us more visible, to make our quest to learn and to adapt more visible. Um, I think there's a, um, a, long, a long way to go, so. Thank you, Julie. That was okay. I want to, um, we're going to turn to the Q&A in just a few minutes, but before we do, I wanted to say, well, I want to say thank you to Ken for introducing us to his wine network. I think Ken may have the best job of anybody I know of, except maybe for Julie. And Ken has lower stress because he doesn't have to worry about the environment burning up around him. But Ken introduced us to um, Maria and Jose Rivero at RGNY, a winery on the North Fork of Long Island. They also have a vineyard in Pata, Mexico. And uh, Angel and Carmen and I went out and talked to them about, I think, I know, I, we work across time scales, so from the weather to the subseasonal to the seasonal and out into the future with other researchers at the Earth Institute. But we wanted to try to understand what decisions uh, we might be able to usefully inform that get made at a place like RGNY or to Sabora. So I wanted to ask Angel if he wanted to make a quick comment before we pivot to questions from the audience. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, we actually have been, uh, um, it has been a, a pleasure actually to be able to ident quite identify these demands I was talking before with uh, RG and Y and, and, in Long Island and, and also with Julie. Last year we were on a panel too, remember Julie? Like also talking and quite identifying like these different needs mm -hmm. that uh, in the case of, of the wine industry we have. And indeed, the, 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 to be able to provide Julie and or GNY and other uh, farmers, like this information at multiple timescales, as we were saying before, is, is uh, I think, exactly what they need because the decisions are not only made for today or for next week or for 10 years from now, but as a continuous, continuum, as I was saying before. So, so yeah, probably we can come back to this, uh, this point. You asked me to be brief, John, so that's it. Thank you. And we've got some interesting questions popping up in the in the Q and A box. Um, I'll just pick some out and, and ask them of others and answer some myself. Uh, there was someone who's anonymous who said, "Thanks for sharing your amazing work. What do you see as the next frontier for practical applications of IRI's research, and are there ways alumni can get involved?" Um, First of all, thank you for describing our work as amazing. We think so, but um, it's nice to hear others say that as well. Um, I would suggest getting in touch with me or with Ken. And as Angel was saying, the way that we like to work is understanding the decisions that are being made on the user side, and then we can work with you. 
And if there's an area of our work that's of particular interest, we would love to talk further with you. Um, Julie, there are a couple of questions that I think are really best suited for you. Um, one is, what are the biggest threats to viticulture from the understood effects of climate change? Is it risks such as soil acidity, soil salinization, changes in pests, et cetera? Um, I think one of the things that, that really zings right into my heart there is the question of disease resistance and pest control. As, as climates change, as there's more pressure on climate, <clears throat> for example, a, a, a moist, um, hot environment, as one of your colleagues has, has traced 400 years back in France and viticulture, realizing that high heat, high humidity not only establishes very difficult and dangerous harvest situations for individuals, but also creates a, a situation where you're having to bring in more pesticides to fight more disease and to fight, you know, to fight pests and to, to fight mildew. And, and that is a vicious circle to get into. One of the things that you can do that I believe sincerely that one can do is, is break up the monoculture just a bit. It doesn't mean that you have to lose productive land, quite the contrary. Um, it's it, how can you integrate crops that are productive crop, you know, beneficial crops? How can you rotate? You can't really rotate grapevines, but you can um, be wise about what you're planting for hedgerows and for intervine uh, crops. There's a great deal of potential there that I think hasn't been tapped. And it's, um, I believe that uh, increasing the diversity in a certain plot of land, of productive land, really can cut down on the disease pressure and on the uh, pest infestation and thus reduce our need to apply quite so many um, uh, chemicals in a, almost a prophylactic way. Well, we know every year we have to spray four times every 10, you know, we have to spray 10 days every 10 days. Well, no, our systems now can show us so much more about that. But what we do in the vineyard and when we do in terms of inter, intervine planting, hedgerow establishment, um, barn owl and uh, bluebird box implanta in, implants all over, those are kinds of things that everything is impactful, but I think there are things that we can each do that are, can mitigate. Great, thank you very much. And then we have a, a very important question. Um, Julie, where can we find your wines? Are they available on the East Coast? <laughs> actually, actually, in certain places in New York, it, you can find it through my distributor, Wineboo, W-I-N-E-B-O-W, but mostly through me. Thank you very much for asking. It's, that, is, that is something that's certainly helpful to point out. When you're talking about sustainable systems, it's really important to look at, and this is something that's come from having to deal with COVID, artisanal producers really do make up the fabric of the community and the, to the extent that people are supporting those of us who are trying very hard to hang in there. Closed, open, closed, open, closed, open, fires, smoke, COVID, fire, smoke, COVID, uh, you know, it, support of artisanal producers from cheese to vinegar to, uh, you know, to flowers, those are all things that make a huge difference. So thank you for asking. Just contact us directly at Trace the Boris. Um, be happy to help you with some wine. Yeah, and they have a, a beautiful yeah, website. Um, let's see. I think I will. I hope everybody is happy. <laughs> Um, there was another question that I'll direct again to Julie. Are there policy changes at the state or federal levels that could help the wine industry adapt to climate stressors? Yes, well, definitely. Um, one of the things that people have been talking about is, um, is some collective relief or some, whether it's, it's carbon trading or whether it's um, seed money to finance um, things like carbonators or things like crimpers, or research into organic farming, which is sadly uh, lacking. Um, so setting up, you know, um, there are small efforts, um, but for example, the COVID funding that was needed this year in California completely wiped out the uh, funding for the program that would help farmers establish um, 
whole bunch of, of soil enrichment, uh, uh, farm diversity and climate interface sort of changes this year. So a little extra seed money for, um, for organizations. Wine industry is full of very smart people trying to adapt and in, in, you know, in incremental ways, get their statistics and their data up. But, um, but at this point, I think uh, we really could use um, support to be able to drill down and, and to, to do some uh, you know, collective investment or um, even just basic research like you guys are doing. You know, that's, that's, that would be continuing to be very, just setting down the facts, helping this all get on the same grid. On hell, you and I have talked about this in the past, just getting on the same grid for how we all measure these things. What's our language? Um, something to help drive that education. That's the, where some of the idea for the climate fellows have come from because um, I think the language has to make sense to the people who are penciling out the bottom line all the time. So that's a great question. And I, fingers crossed that we have some, some way, some vehicle to, to put more of that into effect because the farmers are ready. You know, um, you always, the, the shelves are full right now of, of wine, international wine. It is an international business. There's a lot to be gleaned, but we all share the, the goal for helping out. We can, we, we have that goal. We see we get better wine if our soils are healthy. Bottom line, easy, but how do you, how do you monetize that? How do you describe that in a balance sheet sort of way is the question. So there's, there's one question that I'm going to direct to all of us, and I'll start by answering it. Um, but I moved the Q&A. Oh, there it is. Um, sorry. So somebody said, very cool to hear how climate science is helping farmers respond to climate change, climate challenge. Um, is there anything analogous that we as civilians can do in our daily lives? Um, I can give my own example, which is going to sound very much like a first world problem. But um, ever since I used to live in Washington, I worked for the US Agency for International Development. And when I would go, when my family and I would go skiing, I found that I could call Tony Barnston, who used to be the climate forecaster, the main climate forecaster for the IRI. And he could tell me, and three or four years running, he would say, well, Tony doesn't uh, ski, he's a body surfer, but he would say, well, John, I don't, I don't <laughs> ski, but if I were you, I would go to Colorado or further north this year because it's looking like it's going to be dry over this winter in the, you know, in the New Mexico area or whatever. So just learning more about the information that's available and thinking about the decisions that we all make. You know, there are, uh, during an El Nino, there are, tend to be fewer hurricanes in the Caribbean. So you can decide that two years ago would have been a better year to go to the Caribbean than this year. Um, but I'll let uh, Carmen or Julie or Angel answer as well. Um, well, I'll go first. Um, if the question is about what can we do to fight uh, or to, um, to, to fight climate change, um, I would I would think about what can I do now? Like when we talk about climate change, we talk about projections in 50 years, in 100 years, at the end of the century, but we need to understand um, what's gonna be the change in the climate in three months, in maybe in a year, in, in six weeks, in order to, to be able to understand what can we do. If we're talking about uh, what can we do uh, at an individual level as well. Um, I used to work in the food industry. Um, I'm a black sheep, <laughs> let's put it that way, uh, before joining IRI. And I'm a true believer of um, the power of the consumer. So if you wanna fight climate change, whether it's the projection of climate change in 50 years or in three months, I will be very careful of where I choose um, um, the food that I eat. It should be, I recommend it to be locally sourced rather than, you know, getting, I don't know, um, an exotic fruit 
that grows only in in Central America or in Southeast Asia and has to be shipped all the way to the U.S. Um, so maybe those are the two things that you know we should look we should be looking into. No, you want to add anything? Well, you can buy um, you can buy products that you know about, basically, and I think that's Carmen. I think that's what you're saying, right? Is is um, find a wine merchant who is going to pay attention to, or a sommelier in my, you know, in the case of wine, find somebody and also find a restaurant where the line between the chef and the sommelier and the wines that there's a, there's a consistent philosophy that goes across the board. That's, I see a lot of disconnect in terms of, um, in terms of who's bringing in what sort of glossy ideal. Um, but I think on a very baseline level, you can establish a relationship, encourage your wine merchant, your grocer to know more and to invest more in understanding about what practices those farmers, connecting people to the, to the farming. You know, it's like going to a farmer's market and all the roots are trimmed beautifully and nobody really has an idea that there really are roots and there really is healthy soil and passion, you know, behind that. The, the connector bees out there, the gatekeepers, the, the merchants out there, um, you can really support uh, farmers and this effort by helping those people understanding how much those practices mean to you. Yeah. Okay. If I may, actually, this is just, you know, to complement the same uh, ideas. I totally agree with what has been said. And I am going to underscore, underline uh, this uh, key component, which is translation. As we said, we are demand driven. That means that it's not the traditional climate science sitting somewhere. You know, you're talking about, you know, what can you do? You are, I don't know if exactly like the person who's, who asked that question is doing it right now, but in general, everyone is helping through that translation, through that co-identification of what are the concrete demands. Why is not only about climate change, which is, you know, one of these different nodes that you have, one of these different instruments that you have in an orchestra. So remember, like climate is that harmony, is, is that like the final a symphony that you listen to? But it has so many different instruments and nodes, some faster, some other are slower. So if you want to think in terms of climate change as those instruments are like playing some some notes like more slowly, you need to understand what's going on with us, you know, like in, in a, through, through this translation, through this like co-development process that we are discussing, you need to identify what is the role of each one of those instruments and how they are impacting your particular, let's say, industry or decision-making process. So you are key because the, 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 the climate scientists or the social scientists by itself cannot do this. We need you to do that. And you, a lot of you are already doing it. So it's just to complement what Julie and Carmen and, and actually John mentioned. So, and I was sort of joking about the skiing, but I was trying to get at the point Angel was making, which is that as we all understand more about what information is available, somebody who doesn't work in climate at all may come up with the brilliant idea for how to apply some of this information to solve a really important uh, challenge. There's a question about, for the IRI folks, about does our business model for working, uh, I think they mean this cooperative approach to working with client farmers, have broader applications beyond farmers, beyond farming. And I'll say that, um, I'll answer a bit and then let Carmen and Angel weigh in as well. Um, absolutely. We've been working, we, IRI has been at the forefront of the development of what's called weather index insurance. So we're working with the financial sector to design insurance products. Again, it started with farmers because we wanted to design an insurance product that would pr protect smallholder farmers without costing a lot to send a claims adjuster out to inspect for damage. So with the index insurance, you take the, the climate information, you set a threshold and say, if it doesn't rain a certain amount by July 1st, that triggers a payment. So the cost of, of the insurance product to the company setting aside the payout itself, but the product itself is almost free. Um, 
and that methodology can be replicated. So there's no, you need far fewer staff than you do. And that model has been taken to ensure um, countries and uh, it's being applied broadly. We work in disaster management. We work with the Red Cross. We work with the World Bank and their disaster management group. Um, Angel and Carmen can speak a little bit about our work on public health, if you'd like to step in. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if you meant Angel or me, <laughs> but you know, I'm Either of you. just going ahead. Um, yeah, we've been working with the um, health sector. Um, maybe Angel can talk more about the um, IDES map room. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're working in Guatemala with the Ministry of Health and the Secretary of Food and, and uh, Food Security and Nutrition. We're developing a fork, uh, tool that allows them to forecast the number of cases of kids under five that are undernourished based on climate, not climate factor. Um, we're, but also apart from the health sector, and now I'm gonna talk more about that. Um, I will also like to mention the work that we're, uh, we're developing in Colombia with the energy sector. Through this next gen forecast, um, the National Met Service got a demand by, um, by the energy sector, uh, the hydropower sector in Colombia. Uh, just so you know, for those who are not aware of this, hydropower sector is the main um, power source in, in Colombia. And then whenever they don't have enough rain, uh, then they start using the, um, uh, the coal and, and gas and, and other sources of energy. So um, for then knowing, especially during COVID when there was a, a a peak on the demand, knowing what's going to happen with uh, with um, with the rain and the rain and the precipitation patterns in the next few months was key, um, and that affects not only um, electricity at the domestic level but also at a national policy level. So it goes beyond um, farmers and agriculture. It affects um, any sector that is going to be impacted by climate stressors or or, or climate variables. Yeah, totally. And I, I want to just follow up on that because already uh, Carmen and, and John explained the kind of, of work on, that we do and how that goes beyond farming. Um, so in the case of health, we actually work very closely. We have been doing that for a while because the IRI is a collaborative center of the World, World Health Organization. And we have recently um, developed um, a new set of tools that permit, like it's helping the Pan American Health Organization to both monitor and also forecast uh, environmentally uh, suitable conditions for the propagation, the transmission of uh, uh, diseases like Zika, Dengue, or Chikungunya. And we have done that actually with uh, some funding from uh, NOAA and a few other uh, important agencies. So, so, you know, it's like, as Carmen just said, if we can co-identify with you guys that climate has, uh, some impact. It doesn't need to be the most important factor because in real life, a lot of things actually are not directly related to climate. A lot of things might, but in general, it's more important those socioeconomic factors. If we can identify how climate can impact your decisions, we might be able to help. And actually, that's what we have been doing. As uh, John explained, IRI has been uh, doing this work for 25 years now. And, and, and definitely we will continue doing it. And that's why I think that the kind of work that we do, coming back to my original intervention, is this um, climate and society science. It's not like the pure, like if you want more traditionally nerdy climate science with physicists and blah, 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 and the social science working somewhere. And sometimes they talk, it's like climate and society scientists as one thing. And that cannot be applied to, as we just said, um, you know, crops, energy, health, and so many, many other disaster risk management, these financial instruments that are going to be, are being useful and are going to keep being useful for a lot of other sectors. So thank you. Every oh, Julie, very quickly. We do right, real, real quickly. You've touched on something that's really important for farmers. One thing is transportation, a mode of transportation and what's used, what type of energy source is used to propel that transportation to market. Um, and another key thing would be supply side, uh, supply chain. So uh, for example, there's an initiative here to use the lightest possible bottles to institute um, entire, the, change the industry over to new packaging situation. 
you know, new packaging. So, so those are things that need monetizing and incentivizing. Most of us um, on the on the wild space side of the Napa Valley have had our insurance cut three years in a row now. And so uh, the use, even though it applies to definitely to developing world, the use of those models in our world right now could be really valuable. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to everyone. I can't believe it, but an hour has passed. So we will have to close this out. Thank you for joining us for this evening's Columbia at Home. We hope you found the conversation informative and thought provoking. I certainly did. If you'd like to more, learn more about our research or Julie's Winery, please visit the resources link at either the Kale app or on the website. And then please tune, again, tune in again at the same time next week for the fifth and final collaboration between the Leaders Experience and Columbia at Home, Perspectives on Leadership with Stuart Sender, uh, a journalist, activist, and Academy and Emmy nominated filmmaker and producer. Wow. Um, Rumi Chisenga, a 2019 Obama scholar, and Chelsea Miller, um, a class of 18 of Women Everywhere Believe, who will share with moderator Susie Mal <laughs> Suzanne Malvo um, of CNN, also a graduate of Columbia. Um, how the future of leadership requires multiple perspectives and collective problem solving. And finally, if you haven't registered for the closing session of the Columbia Alumni Leaders Experience, Kale is definitely easier to say. Um, that's on Saturday, November 14th. It features uh, President Lee Bollinger interviewing Secretary, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Um, so please register for that. And thank you very much for joining us. Have a great evening and stay safe and healthy. Good night.